Hi everybody, I'm Phil Hayes Brown, Well Our CEO, and this is and welcome to Exploring Inclusion, where we talk to community and business leaders and we explore the topic of inclusion. Today we have Moira Kelly with us, amazing humanitarian, mother to many, I think I'll put it that word in there because it's too many, um, an advocate, a global campaigner, and winner of dozens of uh, Australian and international humanitarian awards. Moira, it's a privilege to have Lovely you with to us. Lovely to be here. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So Jim. nice to have you here. So Lovely welcome. to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so where did this all start, Moira? Why, why your whole life's been committed to disadvantaged people? Where does that come from? I suppose as a young child that I, um, when I was a young girl, I grew up in Melbourne, and I saw a film on Mother Teresa. Yes. And I was flabbergasted and couldn't believe the work she was doing. And I think we all have seeds in our life that are planted as young people, and it's how we grow and nurture that. So certainly during the life that I saw films and then I saw books on her, and and that was my dream and to work with Mother Teresa and live with her. So overseas, as my eventually I did. I spent two years in Calcutta with Mother Teresa. Yes. And um, yeah, so Mother Teresa is one of those people that it was probably my first inspiration behind my parents. I think right. our first mentors are our parents, and then certainly Mother Teresa was next. Now I read a story about you that when you were going to your school, you climbed the fence to sort of help feed the kid, the special school kids next door. Well, I tell you what it was. It was actually St George's in Carlton, and okay. you remember St Nick's Hospital was based. That was the first children's hospital. Then it became a hospital for children with disabilities. Okay. So St George's is across the road from that, and so. At morning tea and lunchtime, everyone said they'd always know where Moira was. I was usually munching my wagon wheel and looking over the fence at the kids gone off their buses. And I always said as a young child, I'd like to work with these kids. And, and I was only in primary school myself, but wow. I used to be flabbergasted about the people who were caring for them and also the, the people themselves. So I obviously, in my heart, I always wanted to do this sort of work. Okay. Um, now, a reminder to uh, let us know where you're watching from. We're live, Moira. It's a bit terrifying, isn't it? Really? Facebook Live. And <laughs> so, it's fans out there, tell us where you're watching from. Send us in questions. We'll, we'll stop and ask questions for Moira if you've got questions for Moira or for us. Please send them in. So, thank you for watching out there. Okay, um, so that's where it all started. Now, Tell us, what's life like in your household now? Meal times must be fascinating. It is. Um, well, I live in Brunswick. Okay. I'm not far from the World Children's because one of my kids needs to go there regularly. Yep. So there's 19 of us when we're all home. 19 when you're all yes, home. Yes, so it's a couple of kids are overseas at the moment or not here. Yes. But um, the other children, is um, they start from now just a year, a year old. Okay. And they go up the, to about 11 now. In the house, and I also have some, apart from children coming to Australia for operations, yes. I also have some displaced women with children who come to me from the Sisters of Mother Trees in Fitzroy. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a, they live in the house as well, and we have a unit across the way we rent. Right. So my plan this year is to try and, or well, the next 12 months, is to get another house for women with children who just fall in the cracks and just need some support. So I'll always do my sick kids from overseas, but yes. the women seem to feed my soul. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, one of uh, uh, the people in that household is Emmanuel Kelly. My and son. Yes. Yes, Emmanuel. And we are we we're very lucky that Emmanuel Emmanuel is a great friend of ours, okay. and he's performed at some of our events and things like that. Um, and he's uh, living life in America. But if we go back to where Emmanuel sort of burst onto the stage, it was the X Factor competition, wasn't it? Yeah, he used to always sing us at competitions when we used to go to Mornington. Actually, they used to have an idol competition down there in the, in the big oh, okay. shopping centre. Oh, really? So he won that once. And oh, so, okay. but I still think it was just a cute little kid singing. But anyway, so when he did X Factor, I'd never heard of X Factor really. I wasn't really watching that show. Yeah. So I learned a lot very quickly. But um. I just thought he was going to go on this and have a good experience and move on, but of course yeah. things opened up for him from that experience, and mm -hmm. uh, and his life hasn't hasn't stopped since. So it was a wonderful journey for him, the X Factor journey, and where it's taken him now. And he's now based in America. Yes, comes home to his mother every few months. He has to. Yes, but yeah, so he was been living in LA, and he just recently moved to to um, another part of the states because uh, right. he's that's where his manager is. Okay. Yeah. 
So, there are these um, two boys and they need your help. Malara, we were very lucky You're in Iraq and they need your help. So That's right. right. Yeah. The she got on a plane, event. she took he, off. He joined the up other with one of our clients of once and they did this incredible duet. You know? Oh, wow, really? And, uh, yeah. Peter's with us in the studio. G'day, Pete. Thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you've come to some of those events. So uh, it's right. been such a treat having um, uh, Emmanuel at some of those. And I follow him through Facebook. So yes. I'm always interested in his hair, cut, his fashion. Oh, don't go there. I'm his mother. He's very stylish, isn't he? Is that what you call it? I don't know. Is that what you he's got a good heart and he's, he's no, passionate no. about what he does and yes. i think with emmanuel he's he loves his music and he doesn't feel his right. disability should be something that holds him back so, right. so he wants to break through that sort of that barrier and, and prove to, to people and to himself that you know you can be a commercial Iraq, viable artist as well with a disability and just go bypass that so you know i admire him for that courage and to be a bit of a storm breaker there so determination Yes. Differently able pop star. That's, that's what he like says. Yeah, very politically yeah. correct. He says yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, but at the end of the day, he's just my son. Yeah. 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 So and uh, you were uh, surprised things. recently. Number one, weren't you? That was a pretty big event, and with a, with one of the world's biggest rock bands. Yes. Well, that happened um, with Coldplay. Yes. I wasn't too sure who Coldplay at the time. I just knew one of their songs because Emmanuel sang all the time and okay. they surprised um, me by bringing Emmanuel to Australia and yes. home in a hotel <laughs> <coughs> and then during the concert they sent us some tickets so we sent all the volunteers and all my kids we all went and we yep. got beautiful seats at the front and he was Emmanuel um, came out in the middle of the stage to surprise me and sang the famous song he sang on X Factor was um, Imagine yes. and he sang it with, with uh, Chris so Chris is actually um, he's now mentoring Manuel with his music yep. and he's been t terrific and Manuel's been very blessed by that and he's just released a song called Eat Us and it was one of the songs that Chris chose to have um, that one be the first release because it's got a bit of a backstory so wow. so you can get that on iTunes or something well, cool. yeah so that's a big, big big thing for him yeah Chris Martin great man yeah, he's, he's a, a great um, great yeah. values and yes. also a great humanitarian as well as a great musician and his lyrics often talk about you know will like breaking down the barriers and right. social justice and so uh all people who are going through things so yeah he's a very deeply spiritual man too i think oh that's cool what a great yeah. connection for him yeah. Yeah, yeah and i remember as he was over in america knocking on doors and doing it any gig he could find you know trying to sort of you know yeah, be discovered it, yeah. or meet people um, and Peter, Peter was with him for a lot of that time too. So it's great that it's, it's paying off. It's a, hard a lot of hard work. It is a hard uh, work, hard and yeah. he still doesn't bring me paychecks home, as I say. Right. But, uh, yes. but he says, "Mum, I'm an artist, so I've got to go with it." <laughs> so as a mum, I've got to bite my tongue and just let, let him do his thing. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, Emmanuel's brother Ahmed is pretty um, increasingly well known too. He's represented our country, hasn't he? Yeah, twice in the, um, well, twice in the Olympics and yeah. also lots of international events as well, but yeah. he's been to London Rio on the big stage and some world championships and yeah. so he's our swimmer in the family. So yes. you know, I often say, when people say, I want to talk to your son, which one, the singer or the swimmer? I say <laughs> usually, the, <laughs> the singer or the swimmer. So Ahmed is um, now based in Canberra. He's got a scholarship for high performance swimmers. Yeah. And uh, his plan is to get to Tokyo and represent Australia again. So he's very committed. I often say I have one son that gets up at 4.30 every morning to swim yes. and the other one gets up at 4.30 in the afternoon. Yes. <laughs> so what can I say as a mother? That's right. <laughs> so, That's yeah. Right. And how's he handle Canberra's cold? It is. Well, I suppose Melbourne can be cold, but yeah, I think he loves Melbourne. Look, yeah. Ahmed's an AFL boy. His okay. whole life is football, really. Okay. He would have gone on to the AFL if he could have. Right. But he loves all sports, so Melbourne's sort of the capital of the sport anyway. So yeah. he loves, he knows he needs to be in Canberra, but he misses home. He loves right. his family. Right. He's a family boy, but also he loves Melbourne. So he figures he's got to do the, the hard yards to get somewhere. So that's his... That's his Okay. That's his thoughts, you know. Oh, this is pretty fun. We've got uh, Emmanuel says hi coming through on the Facebook feed at the moment. Oh, so really? Wave, he's watching. Um, Anything to say, Mum? Yeah, have you had your shower? <laughs> <laughs> have you had your shower? Keep yeah. your room neat and tidy. Yeah, you need nice yes. and tidy, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Don't forget to call Mum, that's right, Phil. That's right, I mean, good to, good to see you, mate. Um, another question that's come in on the feed too is um, footy teams. Now it's Melbourne, it's, it's AFL finals time. What happens if you all, do you all barrack for one team or is there multiple teams? Well, I, I'm not really too much into football myself, I'll be honest, Phil. Okay. However, it's footy, days at the, it's footy day at the school today. Ah. <coughs> so um, they all had to wear their footy colours. So, so my kids, my, we've got four at, at school, so the Shards from Gaza and Angels from Pakistan and then little Trishna, so they're all wearing Carlton. Are they? Okay. So we're all Carlton people, except for Ahmed. 
Okay. Um, it's been a, a legendary Essendon supporter. Okay. So we're pretty good about that. But Sister Fran, who's with us for years, she's staunch Richmond. So oh. if, if uh, Essendon doesn't do well with Richmond, Ahmed actually won't talk to her. <laughs> so he's probably takes it very serious, he's his football. But most of us, we're pretty easy going. I love watching the grand final. Yes. But I'm not really too much in AFL, but there is something about the grand finals of Victorian. Right. And to tell the truth, I'm yeah. happy for all teams. I'd love, I'd like Carlton to do well, I suppose. But... As I, I think it must be a Victorian thing. If it was South Africa playing against Collingwood, I'd still go for South Africa. And I don't know why. <laughs> it's maybe something you entrench as a child it about is, Collingwood. Yeah, and I don't know why, but as long as... If it was England against uh, Collingwood, I'd still go for England. <laughs> so right. I don't know what it is, but I think it's a yeah, religious it's thing. Indeed, religious thing. Only right. Victorians yes. understand. That's right. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we, um, footy is a great topic of conversation across Wallara with, with all of our clients as well and, and we're lucky enough that Hawthorne and now St Kilda give us all their merchandise so in our warehouse wow. now we store all the merchandise and anyone who buys footy stuff online one of our clients is picking and packing and shipping it to them. No so, way. Yeah, oh, cool, how wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so wow. Now get to handle all the merchandise and pick and pack and ship Wow. For what, what, what clubs? Hawthorne and St Kilda bring that to us as well. No way. Yeah, wow. Yeah. God. Oh, they're great. Wow. And it's, uh, as we explore inclusion, you know, uh, in this sort of story, yeah. that's examples, right, of how yeah. can footy be more inclusive. And that's what we were talking yeah. to the CEO last, a few weeks ago, of St Kilda Footy Club about that. You know, wheelchair footy, merchandise, Fabulous. you know, different ways to make the whole footy thing yeah. more inclusive for everybody wow all right so the, the the story i'd love you to tell is the disability parking sticker story is that right <laughs> well it goes back a few years now of course i have to think now how far it was but i just remember um my two sons ahmed manuel are from mother Teresa's place in iraq yes and um and i brought them to australia where they had their surgeries and they, they hadn't had surgeries yet and they had severe limb deficiencies yep. so anyway so what happened one was um uh, we were at the car park this particular day and we were looking for parking because I have a disabled sticker on my car as a sticker with a disability yes. and um, my boys didn't know too much about it. I keep it simple, their English wasn't great those days but all yes. they knew is we can park, they matches, the, the sticker right. matches the car spot. So I said, okay boys, I can't find a spot. So whoever finds it first, I said, you know, uh, something will happen. Whatever it is, come on guys, let's have a competition. Of course, manuals allowed us in the house. So anyway, they finally found one and we got in there and. And we'd done this for, for months by this stage, you know. And But this particular day, I must have been doing something. And so I was in the car, sitting there. And then one of them shows up and says, um, Mum, what, what does that mean, that, um, that disability? I said, um, I said, what do you mean? I said, well, what does it mean? Why, why do we park here? I said, well, we get free parking. You get closer to the building. Mm. Yeah, but what does it actually mean? I said, well, well that, tick, that sticker there matches the ground. So it was like a puzzle. <laughs> right, OK. So then he says, um, well... So the disability thing, mm. so why do we sit there? Well, it just means people in our car can get closer to the thing because it's, it's difficult. Mm. I said, oh, well, 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 what's difficult? Well, sometimes it's just too far to walk, Emmanuel, so it's closer. And, you know, and so, you know, that's so people in the car have a disability so we can park here. Mm. So I can't remember if it was Emmanuel or the army, but then one of them yelled up and said, oh, geez, mum, so someone in our car has a disability. <laughs> and I sort of went, well, yeah, they do. And I think it was Emmanuel goes, oh my God, Ahmed, they must be talking about you. <laughs> and I'm going, well, believe it or not, Emmanuel, I said, in my country, you know, I know it's really weird, but people actually think it's um, maybe you too. <laughs> what? <laughs> me? I said, well, really, me? I said, yeah, but, and he said, quiet. I said, yeah, I said, well, mum, what is it I can't do? And I was sort of went quiet, and I said to Emmanuel, I said, yeah, what is it I can't do, Mum? I said, well, actually, you know, you can do everything, but let's pretend you can't, because we've got a really good parking spot here. <laughs> I said, but I don't know why, but people from disabled people, people in my country call you disabled. So, <laughs> right. and my, of course, Ahmed Emmanuel had no, just very deformed limbs and yes, um, yes, no yes. lower arms. And yes, so, yes. and Emmanuel's, Ahmed had the legs taken off, and Ahmed had, Emmanuel had one. So they were very, very severe. Yes limb yes. deficiencies, like yes. just, just one or two limbs, but oh, well, wasn't it wonderful? Yeah, Manuel was, was convinced it must be Arba because it couldn't be him. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it just shows you that they bypassed that and they thought, well, I said, look, let's pretend you're disabled when we get the car so we stay go. here, okay? And, and the people of Melbourne won't even notice. So, right. so you've got to see their innocence as well, how lovely yeah, it was at a young age, you know? Great story. Um, now we've got another question. Um, oh, this is interesting. Which one was better, Moira, the uh, Order of Australia um, a medal or the cold play surprise. I don't know how you compare those. They're pretty different. But, you know. Well, I don't know if I could actually say that. I just think there were the AO was was a big honour. Yes, yes. And probably for me, it's 
you know, for me, it helps me get visas for kids and it gives you credibility. So it's completely different. So I'm not a person that really should be very showy about the AO. I'm just a very humble, normal person. So so as often I don't use it at all. But the Coldplay was just a wonderful experience and to see Emmanuel's dream come true that night. Yes. And the doors open for him. I think that surprise quiet. You had to be part of that, Peter Manley. Well, we (laughs) won't discuss that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so... so, but I originally made the contact for Emmanuel with the people there because um, some people rang up and asked me about this from America. And I said, well, actually, my son's over there at the moment. Mm. So then they followed him up. So really, it came that way to me. But I sent it back there, but not knowing what was going to eventually happen. So, yeah, Emmanuel, um, that was a wonderful night. And all of us had seen the kids there. And Chris was so beautiful in his band with our mm. kids. And so so generally kind and it was just one of those moments in life you never forget it was yes. that, and we all went to the after party with the oh, bags cool. it was their first concert in melbourne and here we are in the city at three o'clock in the morning and i've got some of my young kids there with this after party with this big <laughs> rock band so it was actually very funny yeah so by the time they all left all my old volunteers all the young volunteers are gone so all my volunteers are 60 up are the ones who were still hanging out there at the after party <laughs> so you know, it was a wonderful night it was That's great so to nice. reward some of my volunteers to be there that night too so Chris is a good man, and um, he's in good hands with Ahmed. Man- Manuel's in good hands with him. Now, the twins, uh, who are 11 or 12 now? They're 11 now, yeah. 11 yep. now. Krishna and Trishna, um, uh, who were separated in 2009, and that was a huge operation, wasn't it? Yeah, that how, was, yeah. How are they going now? They're good, yeah. The Trishi and Krishi were craniopagus twins, which means they were joins of the head, yes. and that's the rarest type of conjoined twin. So... Trishy and Chrissy are probably the only um, craniopagus mm. twins in the world with no neurological deficits. Wow. So we've done a phenomenal job wow. here at the World Children's. Yep. Um, but uh, Chris, Trishy's at school and yep. she's in grade five. So people, a lot of people get lost. They still think they're babies. They get a yes. shock when they hear they're this old. Yes. Ten years next year, they've wow. been separated. So Trishy plays tennis and she plays soccer wow. and she's learning guitar. So she's out there doing everything. Yep. And a real little girl, a real girly girl. Yeah. And Chrissy's my little one with special needs, and okay. uh, she's had a bit of an arduous journey, really, and she's um, got a lot of medical issues as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. she probably took a brunt of it all, but um, she's also a very happy little girl, and yeah. we wouldn't change her for bits. We just love and adore everything about Chrissy, but um, right. and she's the reason I need. I don't, I don't really live far from the children's hospital. Right. Yeah. So she's um yeah so she's often there, and she has lots of specialty departments. So right. she's a. She's a well, well-known well person at the World Children's, but she goes to a, a development school as well. Yeah, like my daughter. Yeah, yeah like your daughter, exactly. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so, and they, she loves school. To see her, we never thought we'd ever see her get on a school bus yeah. away from us, but she absolutely loves school. So my school at Waratah in Belfield is doing a really good job because Chrissy loves it. Right. Yeah, we, yeah. we miss her at school every day. We think they're at school too much. You miss them, but anyway, yes. she loves school. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And now, um, as you know, you got an open invitation to bring the girls and all the family down to the farm. I yeah, would, I'm definitely going to the school holidays, yeah. yeah. Probably not these school holidays. I'm in Gaza, these school holidays. I've got to ta- go to the pa- Palestine. But um, the next school holidays, I would love to do that. Very good, yeah. very good. Um, okay, well, why don't we talk about schools, you know, special schools, mainstream schools. Most of your kids have gone through mainstream schools. But um, how, you know, if you could do anything to help with inclusion and understanding, you know, some of the kids some, that you have done amazing things for, you know what it's like when you walk down the street, you know, and you see yep. reactions from people. What do you think we can do, more around inclusion? Well, probably my biggest thing would be for me, because my, Chris is the only one with special needs. All my other yep. children have physical disability. Yes. But I found, you know, I've had children, even from Bosnia, who have missing limbs, but people can accept that, okay. I found for my journey is the children I bring out who have facial deformities or burns or... And I found that probably very confronting. People in Australia, just sometimes they stare. Mm. Um, I just think... And and, and families don't know how to teach their children how to react to people with disability. So um, not just children, adults, but I found that... um, if there was some sort of educational campaign to Mm. break down the barriers and educate children at school and also families how to talk to their children about this Mm. in another way because I've just found and I've also found sometimes when you've got the pack mentality when you're out in the in the public in a shopping centre or something and you've got a child like this but when a couple of teenagers are together Mm. if they're on their own they wouldn't but when they're teenagers they can be quite cruel Mm. and you've got to still realise those teenagers belong to a mum and dad somewhere and a family Mm. somewhere and they've got to realise the person you've got in your care mm. belongs to a mum and dad somewhere too mm. and they're loved as well. And um, it's very, very hurtful. So mm. you become like a bit of a, a mother hen and you just, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and yeah, when you get up there and you won't tolerate that with any child, but yeah, one that's the, hard. One of the things we're doing with this media and our videos is trying to tell, tell more stories and get it out there, you know. So we have mainstream schools come and visit us, they bring in their students, and we talk about them. Lisa, who's helping us today in the studio, and we've talked to some of those schools, haven't you, Lisa? Yes, I have. You do a great job. So, and they walk in not knowing much about disability, Wonderful. if you like. Talk to some, and we, when they leave, we get them to fill in a survey. It's amazing the change, you know. So amazing education through watching stories, yeah. meeting people, you know, integration. And sometimes bringing things back to normal. Like I found with one little boy I had from Somali, he had a really large head. And I was with Ahmed many at the time when we were coming back from a country area, and we stopped into a McDonald's, and I always remember. I didn't, we were sitting at McDonald's, I was about to order, and I could hear this yelling and laughing going on behind a, a, a counter. Mm -hmm. And then um, I didn't know what it was, and little Osman, who's got probably a little special needs as well, he'd go, Auntie Moira, he's laughing, laughing, and he's reacting to these people doing it. And then I realised mm -hmm. he was being directed at our table, mm -hmm. and it was the staff behind the counter, behind the, in the kitchen. And I, I, I didn't want to do anything until I knew, so I went up. And then Ahmed, um, don't make a scene, he mm -hmm. says to me, he was only young at the time, but I went up there and I waited in line, and they were so oblivious to me in the line with other people in the public. They were still just all looking over this table and right. saying some of the most horrific things. Right. And I finally, once I knew, I remember just yelling at the top of my voice. I said, shame, shame, shame on you. I said, there's about five or six of you back there. And I said, statistically speaking, one of you are going to, you're going to be parents one day and one of you are going to have a child yeah. who will need to go to the Royal Children's Hospital. Yeah. And it says, I want you to remember this day as long as you live yeah. and remember how you made me feel as a parent to this child over there that you could be so cruel. I says, what? I said, you're probably the same hypocrites that are raising money at your school for the World Children's Hospital and you'd laugh at a child like this. And they all went quiet and the manager came up and said, no, you don't need to say something. You're not their parents and their parents aren't answerable either. They're all old enough to know better. I said, shame on you as an Australian that I have to sit there as a Victorian and hear you laughing at a boy with a very large head. Mm and who has got such a beautiful mm. natural personality who's laughing at you thinking you're being nice to him. I says, mm. shame on you. And then these people, customers started clapping and they got upset too. I says, but um, you will all remember this day, I says, mm. and, and you'll lie your head in shame. And may you not lie on a soft pillow for a few nights, I said, all of you. Right. And that's, sometimes a parent, you, do, you just you have to do it. Up, you, you have to speak you, up, exactly. yeah. So, you know, sometimes like that, I just think we need to go back to education and bring them back to Wow, would you do that to a child who goes to the World yes. Children's Hospital? That's why he's here. Yeah, yeah. So you just need to bring it back to, and that comes back about education as well. But um, yeah. if we could teach families how to teach their children how to react, yeah. you shouldn't have to teach them kindness and decency. That should just come naturally. But yeah. I do believe if we could um, educate even schools on how to treat, treat people with disabilities or people who are different. Yeah, the, the one thing that gets us some traction, I think, with these kids is to realise that disability is just a risk of life that we all share. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's not like, Perfect, oh, that's yeah. those people. I'm not in that. I'm not part of that group. Mm. Well, sadly, you could be tomorrow. You know, you can, yep, you absolutely, can cross the road yeah. and, you know, all of us share this risk. So we're yeah. all part of one community. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, generally speaking, most of us are good. Yeah, exactly. You just got the, the pack mentality and sometimes the people who just don't know how to react, so they react this way. Yeah, and it's ignorance or lack like of understanding. Ignorance, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of back to innocent education. ignorance sometimes, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but the, their innocent ignorance can hurt people. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so um, now today, uh, well, these days, you've run lots of foundations and Children's First and different things, but at the moment, tell us what you're leading at the moment. Well, I left my last foundation after the girls were separated, okay. and I tend to go back, but I never did. I suppose you can't go into a dream like that and expect to be the same person. Yes, yes. So our children can change our adult lives Indeed. as well yes. in more ways than one. And so I didn't want to have an organisation again. I just wanted to do my work, take bring kids in from overseas like in, in the hard basket like Trishna and Krishna. But yeah. some friends got together and said, look, more you need to because you need to get some money in and you need to get people to support you. And I had very strong ideals as long as no one got paid and as long as people were, my people were... Um, uh, all working together but more importantly the kids we don't say no I want to take on children like Trishna and Krishna mm -hmm. so I felt there's always going to be people who bring children into Australia for surgery but there was there were those group of kids that we say no to in the hard basket mm -hmm. and Trishna and Krishna taught us that I think the wonderful word hope and mm -hmm. and so I take on challenging children like that with really chronic problems and uh, problems that are probably very rare yes. so I have a few of those children out the house I have a little girl from Gaza with a condition called halloquinitiosis and as she goes to bed tonight and you and I go to bed tonight mm. we all in our, in our homes um, she makes two weeks of skin 
Wow. What we're making one in one day, and this is a chronic condition, and because she didn't have ex, um, any access to water at times in Gaza and medicines, her fingers have joined, she's got no eyelids, and her feet are like the Japanese women used to get them bounded. So right. we've, I brought her here, she's been here for about nearly three years now. So I have to teach her how to bathe her skin, and so she has ba baths, baths every day with bleach and salt yeah. and yeah. oil. Yeah. And um, we cover her body in like a, a, ver a dermis concoction of like Vaseline. Yeah. And we've had surgery with a surgeon who, two surgeons have taken her on. We didn't know if it was going to work with her skin and it did. Right. And she actually, she was out of hospital in a day. It was supposed to be eight days in hospital. It was fast growing skin. So now we know kids like that can be, so they were doing a medical paper on her. So there's, there's Shard and it's, um, she's a long term sort of problem and then there's a little girl called Angel and she's got a condition called Clove Syndrome which, which we have but not to her severe extent. She's, I often say she's got the world's biggest feet, she was only five, four when she came. Yeah. Her big toe fits in her hand. She's been two and a half years waiting for surgery because she's been so malnourished and her iron levels so we've had to build her up like the twins and so she's going to have surgery the next six weeks to start removing her legs one at wow. a time, not, not together of course because of her vascular malformation so okay. so she's got a really challenging illness as well i've got a little girl from iraq arriving soon and so there's always cases like that so it's sort of a hard basket kids now would take on right. like trishy and chrissy so yeah. i feel they're the legacy of the girls okay so we've got those children i also have um some displaced women now yeah. i've set, set yeah. up in my home who have children yeah. so women who've fallen through the cracks for with no drug and alcohol problems and yeah. and um that's been a really rewarding thing because i've always loved the women and women have sort of fed my soul i just yes. was looking for something more in life even yes. though i love my kids i'll always do that <laughs> so um so we have that's why we have 19 in my home 19. and uh and i'm hoping to open another house next 12 months in melbourne here we so we have we have two places my house and we have a place across the way we rent right with the women with the family there and we're hoping to open another house this year for women as well so now i think we're putting up on the screen the name the moira it. kelly create and hope foundation right so we're all volunteers so no one gets paid yeah so everything goes straight into work we do and um that's one of my things i'm very passionate about i just believe this work is a vocation mm -hmm. so yeah so the moira kelly create and hope foundation would be great to look at our, our facebook page yes and, like us there what we're up to and how our kids and families are doing but um yeah just yeah, stay in touch incredible and, yep. well um moira uh, i looked at the research again i think you're a year younger than me okay um, one year younger it feels uh, like you've been three three of my lives you know i'm sitting <laughs> listening and what have i been doing you know no, no, no. it's incredible to hear what you're doing you're doing amazing work and you keep finding more, I don't know how you find more space to do more, but you keep doing it, and long may that continue. Thank you, Phil. Um, it's wonderful to know you. I hope everyone out there supports Moira's Foundation. We certainly will. Hi, Emmanuel. Oh, um, hi, Emmanuel. Clean up your room, have a shower. Yeah, exactly. That's yes. right. Call she your said mother. It was a good interview. <laughs> it was a good interview. Great. Well, Phil, you do great work too with Lara. I'm just blown away what you guys are doing here and your, and your, your clients and your staff. It's, it's such, you can feel the warmth when you walk in the place. Well, you, you have a big smile on your face walking around thinking, God, what you guys are doing here is amazing. <laughs> so lucky. Love it. Love and, what you're doing. And a big thank you to our studio guest, Peter Mabry over there. Sorry, Peter. Hey, Peter. Great to see Lisa doing all the switches, Jay on the camera. Um, this is the Wallara uh, Facebook team here. And this is, thank you for watching Exploring Inclusion. Don't wait for tomorrow.